Remember that time two men saved the world from certain destruction? No? Well, it's your lucky day because man oh man have our military experts got a story to share with you today. See, most of us grow up wanting to make a difference in the world, some dream even bigger. But now that you're older, and we hope we're not bursting anyone's bubble here, you know that you're probably not going to be asked to save the world anytime soon. You've realized that that is a job more commonly reserved for the likes of fairy tale characters and Marvel superheroes. Today, however, we're here to tell you that not all heroes wear capes. And contrary to what you might expect, the Avengers aren't the only ones capable of saving the world. Sometimes when the conditions are just right, otherwise ordinary individuals can, in fact, make extraordinarily consequential decisions which, in the end, even save the world from near certain devastation. Today, we want to tell you two such cases, stories with such massive implications. If two Soviet military officers did not have the compunction to do what they did, you or I might not be sitting here today. Join us as we recount the tales of Vasily Arkhipov and Stanislav Petrov, history's unsung heroes who twice saved humanity from the brink of thermonuclear annihilation. Our first story unfolded just over 60 years ago, a time when the world teetered on the brink of nuclear destruction. The year was 1962, and the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union was well and truly heating up. Arthur Schlesinger, a renowned historian and special assistant to President John F. Kennedy at the time, called it the most dangerous moment in human history. Both sides had nuclear capabilities and worried, above all, that the other side would not hesitate to use them. In this heightened state of insecurity, even the most innocuous misunderstanding could spiral into an unwanted and potentially even unwarranted nuclear attack. To forestall doomsday, you had to learn as much as you could about the enemy's arsenal and do everything in your power to counter the threat. Throughout the 50s, both the US and the Soviet Union tried to get a leg up on the other. Spy networks, high-altitude aerial photography, and other forms of intelligence kept each side relatively informed as to the other's capabilities. And then July 1962 rolled around, and stuff really started to hit the fan. It all happened in Cuba, the Spanish-speaking island nation just 90 miles off the Floridian coastline. That summer, American officials began briefing US President John F. Kennedy Jr that intelligence assets had detected the presence of Soviet ballistic missiles arriving on the island. Over the next few weeks, more alarm bells began ringing in Washington, D.C. On October 14, 1962, an American U-2 spy plane sent over the island returned with photographic evidence, revealing a series of underground missile sites under construction, to reiterate, just 90 miles from the continental United States. A few decades prior and this type of threat may not have been quite so problematic, that new technology had amplified the destructive power of modern weapons and transformed the very nature of warfare over the course of a single decade or two. These weren't just any missile sites, these were, they feared, nuclear missile launch sites. As President Kennedy digested mock-ups showing the missile's ballistic range extending outward from Cuba in concentric circles until they engulfed the entire southern and eastern seaboard of the United States, American officials knew they were under perhaps the greatest threat in their nation's history. D.C., the Panama Canal, Cape Canaveral, Mexico City, or any city in the southeastern U.S., Central America, or the Caribbean were all now in play. Jet bombers then being uncrated at Cuban airbases could strike anywhere in the Western Hemisphere. Given the nature of nuclear retaliation, the proximity meant the U.S. would have mere minutes to respond if fired upon. The Soviets felt their behavior was justified. The secret basing deal agreed upon by Cuba's communist leaders came as a conscious response to America's forward military posture and, more specifically, the presence of American nukes in Turkey and Italy. The global nuclear arms race, at least according to Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev, could never become one-sided. It would be a tit-for-tat affair until the very end while he remained in power. An eye for an eye, a nuke for a nuke. In other words, Khrushchev wanted to put Kennedy in a bind, and so he did. Already under the microscope for authorizing the CIA's failed bid at overthrowing Fidel Castro's communist regime just a year before, Kennedy had to tread lightly. There were, in fairness, few options available to him. The Soviets did not know that he knew the missiles were there, so he could authorize a surprise attack on the island, risking an immediate and almost inevitable escalation to World War III. He could do nothing, leaving much of the United States vulnerable to a Soviet first strike, or he could try to mitigate the threat, 
first by placing a naval blockade around the island to prevent more missiles from arriving by sea, and then engaging in private negotiations with Khrushchev to mitigate the threat altogether. There was no guarantee that the latter option would work, especially in light of Khrushchev's somewhat bombastic and belligerent personality. Under the circumstances, however, it was the best option available. On October 22, 1962, a flotilla of US naval vessels sailed to quarantine Cuba, forming a ring which blocked all shipments of military supplies from coming into the island. In a tense television address that evening, President Kennedy issued an ultimatum to his Soviet counterpart, demanding he authorize the removal of all nuclear missiles from Cuba. Over the next week, the world would wait with bated breath as Soviet and American diplomats tried to end the standoff. There were only a handful of high-ranking leaders privy to these back-channel conversations, and so as Soviet and American forces stared each other down in the waters around Cuba, this is where our first protagonist comes into the picture. 34-year-old Vasily Arkhipov Vasily found himself on center stage, or more accurately, beneath the stage, underwater on a submarine, during the single greatest drama which would unfold during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Born to Soviet peasants on the outskirts of Moscow in 1926, he had joined the Soviet Navy during World War II and graduated from the Caspian Higher Naval School as the Cold War kicked off, serving as a submarine commander and naval officer on missions in the Black Sea, Baltic, and North Seas. Arkhipov seems to have a penchant for finding himself in incredibly trying situations. By 1961, he had become executive officer on a new ballistic missile submarine, the K-19, the Soviet's first nuclear-equipped undersea vessel. From the start of its service, the K-19 seemed cursed. When it was launched, a man, rather than the traditional woman, was chosen to break the ceremonial champagne bottle over its stern, which, naturally, failed to break, sliding along the propellers and bouncing off the rubber-coated hull. If you've seen Harrison Ford and Liam Neeson in the 2002 film K-19 Widowmaker, you know that was just the start. On a patrol off the coast of Greenland on July 4, 1961, the submarine's starboard nuclear reactor began to leak coolant, causing its cooling pumps to fail. Of course, nobody could reach Moscow on the radio to ask for help since, you guessed it, the radio system had been damaged in a separate incident. Over the next few days, Arkhipov and the sub's two other commanders waited and watched as engineers heroically attempted to jerry-rig a new coolant system. This as the reactor's temperatures soared to over 1,400 degrees Fahrenheit. They succeeded, but at heavy cost. All on board were exposed to radioactive steam, none worse than the engineers who all died of radiation exposure within 30 days. Arkhipov, notably, would later succumb to radiation-induced cancer in 1998, directly caused by the incident. When K-19 eventually returned to service in the Soviet fleet years later, it bore the appropriate nickname Hiroshima. By that time, however, Arkhipov was executive officer of B-59, a larger, new Foxtrot-class submarine off the coast of Cuba. His was one of four submarines sent to patrol international waters around the island as the Cuban Missile Crisis ramped up. Kennedy instructed the 11 destroyers and the aircraft carrier in his quarantine fleet, the USS Randolph, to use whatever force was necessary to compel incoming vessels to stop and consent to a search. If they did not, he retained the right to authorize their sinking. Several days into the standoff, Arkhipov's crew continued their patrol through Cuban waters, waiting for any news from Moscow to clarify whether war had broken out, whether they should respond to the American blockade, or most importantly, whether they should use their nuclear payload they had aboard if so. Deep underwater, tensions rose on B-59. Then it happened. A distant vibration, a shudder, a rumbling boom. The experienced Soviet submariners knew exactly what it was – depth charges. The Americans knew they were there, sheltering deep underwater. But the bigger problem was twofold. The submarine was so deep it could not actually pick up any radio frequencies, much less contact Moscow. It was sealed off from everything happening in real time on the surface. The submarine's chief officer and Arkhipov's immediate superior, Captain Savitsky, had no idea if their governments had in fact declared war on each other or if tensions had cooled, he could only deduce what was happening based on his immediate surroundings. And right then, the only thing he could hear were the depth charges getting louder, closer, and more violent with each detonation. Few aboard believed that the depth charges were anything less than outright hostility. They could not have known that the Americans had orders to use them akin to firing harmless bullets across the bow, a warning to rise to the surface to consent to a peaceful search. 
No, the Soviet captain feared the worst. As breathless hours of waiting turned to days, the situation grew dire. B-59's AC unit broke down. Temperatures soared. As one man on board, Anatoly Andreev, wrote in his journal, for the last four days, they didn't even let us come up to the periscope depth. My head is bursting from the stuffy air. Today, three sailors fainted from overheating again. The regeneration of air works poorly, the carbon dioxide content is rising, and the electric power reserves are dropping. Those who are free from their shifts are sitting immobile, staring at one spot. Temperature in the sections is above 50 degrees, 122 degrees Fahrenheit. Savitsky's stress levels were rising. Feeling like a cornered animal, he played his wild card. He authorized the arming of the ship's nuclear torpedo. If the Americans wanted war, war they would get. Fortunately for the world, the Soviets had a sensible policy in place that prevented Savitsky from immediately getting his way. He needed the approval of all three primary officers on board, himself as captain, the political officer Ivan Semenovich Maslenikov, and the flotilla chief of staff and executive officer Vasily Arkhipov. As second-in-command of B-59, Arkhipov's position as flotilla chief of staff actually gave him partial command authority over the three submarines in the region, B-4, B-36, and B-130. Technically, he even outranked Savitsky. As the B-59 shuddered under the terrifying vibrations of another depth charge, Arkhipov watched as men scurried about, responding to Savitsky's initial order to prepare the torpedoes. They were so powerful, each one carried the explosive power of the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. Savitsky's plan was simple. Aim one at the 11 American vessels and blow a Hiroshima-sized escape hole in the blockade. We're gonna blast them now, Savitsky reportedly said. We will die, but we will sink them all. We will not become the shame of the fleet. A fiery argument ensued. As they debated whether to fire the torpedo, Arkhipov, cool, calm, and more familiar with American naval tactics, tried to reason with Savitsky. The Americans, he believed, were simply trying to force them to the surface. They were not, as Savitsky feared, trying to destroy them altogether. Savitsky, however, could not escape the fear that perhaps nuclear war had already broken out. The second captain, Ivan Maslenikov, agreed and approved the strike. Both turned to Arkhipov. Back in Washington, Robert Kennedy observed his brother's increasing stress. Would the depth charges actually have the opposite effect, escalating the confrontation into a nuclear crisis? The president mulled over the implications. Those few minutes were the time of greatest worry to the president, Robert later said. Back on B-59, Arkhipov stuck to his guns, stoutly disagreeing with his two comrades. He refused to authorize the launching of B-59's torpedoes. With some convincing, Savitsky soon allowed the crew to take the sub to the surface. They were greeted with American destroyers and welcome news that nuclear war had still, thus far, been averted. The Americans did not even board or search the submarine. Amazingly, none of the Americans ever found out there were nuclear weapons on board until three decades later, when the Soviet archives were finally open to the public. Had those torpedoes been launched, one correspondent at The Guardian later wrote, the fate of the world would have been very different. The attack would probably have started a nuclear war, which would have caused global devastation with unimaginable numbers of civilian deaths. The crisis was resolved when the Americans agreed to remove their missiles from Turkey in exchange for the Soviet missiles in Cuba. It was the closest the world would ever come to an all-out nuclear war. Arkhipov was a hero the world would barely know. The aftermath of the encounter was hardly fitting for a man who had heroically resisted authorizing the first salvo of World War III. Soviet Defense Minister Marshal Andrei Grechko reportedly smashed several glasses on his desk when he heard the B-59 had been detected and forced out of hiding by the US. He voiced his outrage later when he told the submarine's commanders, it would have been better if you'd gone down with your ship. Savitsky's sailors met with disgrace upon their return to the Soviet Union. Arkhipov, for his part, would continue to command submarines. He was promoted to Vice Admiral in 1981 and retired several years later. At a 2002 press conference in the United States, just as the world was coming to grips with Arkhipov's heroism, retired Commander Vadim Pavlovich Orlov, present on the B-59 during its mission to Cuba, revealed its nuclear payload and told the audience Arkhipov had been the reason they hadn't been used. Of those tense moments, Orlov said, it felt like sitting in a metal barrel with someone hitting it with a sledgehammer. The signaling charges were so loud, and Arkhipov had to convince Savitsky to not fire despite the high level of CO2. 
the coldest temperature on the sub being 113 degrees, and the crew frequently fainting. If Arkhipov was wrong, almost assuredly everyone on the submarine would die. And even if he was right, the Soviets would likely consider them traitors for surfacing rather than dying with their ship. At the same press conference, Thomas Blanton, director of George Washington University's National Security Archive, would remind everyone how a guy called Vasily Arkhipov saved the world. There is, amazingly, another story in the annals of Soviet history with a similar outcome. Two decades later, on September 26, 1983, another man named Stanislav Petrov began his shift as a duty officer at a secret Soviet Serpikov-15 nuclear command center on the outskirts of Moscow. A lot had changed in 20 years. Satellites now roamed the skies, there had been a man on the moon, the Americans had a multi-decade escapade in Vietnam, and the Soviets were in the process of waging their own proxy war in Afghanistan. Above all, the Cold War droned on. When Ronald Reagan was elected president, the Cold War took another tense turn. Reagan was far more confrontational than his predecessors in the White House. The Soviet Union and US were still arch enemies, still posturing and predicting the next potential flashpoint for a nuclear exchange. Reagan's plan was forthright. Rather than freeze the arms race, he wanted to resume it, and even win it outright with patriotic fervor backed by the sheer might of the American industrial machine. This was his strategy for restoring American flagging international prestige. If America could win the Cold War, it could prove its values were superior to communism, which Reagan regarded as an evil empire. Stanislav Petrov was, by 1983, 44 years old and a member of the Soviet Air Defense Forces. It was the height of the American military buildup, and tensions between the two countries had not been as pointed in years. His superiors constantly worried the Americans would attack. Prior to his service during the Cold War, Petrov had obtained a degree in engineering at the Kyiv Higher Engineering Radio Technical College of the Soviet Air Force. Ever since, he had been working his way up through the ranks until he achieved the rank of colonel. His job as a duty officer was simple but important. He would sit and monitor dozens of Soviet military satellites as they completed their orbits over the United States. If the satellites picked up any exhaust plumes, most notably those associated with a nuclear launch, it was Petrov's job to immediately report the missile launch data as detected by the early warning system to his superiors on the general military staff, who would then tell the leader of the Soviet Union, Yuri Andropov, who would then decide whether the USSR should retaliate. Just a few hours into his shift that fateful September, Stanislav was sitting at his desk, minding his own business, when alarm klaxons resounded throughout the concrete-lined chamber. He had only ever heard this specific alarm in training exercises, but there was no training scheduled today. No, this was an unanticipated, unexpected, and utterly chilling alarm. It was warning that five Minuteman intercontinental ballistic missiles had been launched by the United States and were headed Stanislav's way. He recalled the few moments it took to realize what was happening. For 15 seconds, we were in a state of shock, he said. We needed to understand what's next. Stanislav had only seconds to act. He'd been working with this specific early warning system for a long time. It wasn't exactly perfect, prone to the occasional glitch and error. Could this be that? He had a gut feeling that the Americans had not, in fact, fired the missiles. But in hindsight, he recalled that there was only a 50-50 chance he was right. Once in the air, the Soviets had calculated that it would only take an American ICBM 25 minutes to reach its point of detonation. Would you take those odds? Contrary to the evidence before him, Petrov did. He calmly dismissed the alarm. Deciding against nuclear retaliation, even as the computer insisted, the threat was at the highest level possible. There was no rule about how long we were allowed to think before we reported a strike, Petrov later told the BBC. But we knew that every second of procrastination took away valuable time, that the Soviet Union's military and political leadership needed to be informed without delay. All I had to do was reach for the phone, to raise the direct line to our top commanders, but I couldn't move. I felt like I was sitting on a hot frying pan. Rather than report the incoming missiles, Petrov instead filed the report as a system malfunction. The malfunction occurred as a result of the Soviets rushing the detection system off the line too quickly before it was ultimately ready a response to a similar American system which had recently been implemented. Reagan's plan was working, but it almost backfired in the most catastrophic way. Petrov later told the Washington Post he simply had a funny feeling in my gut. I didn't want to make a mistake. I made a decision, and that was it. Perhaps it was the fact that there were only five missiles that clued him in. 
Were the United States to start a thermonuclear war, especially at this stage of the Cold War, with the stakes higher than they had ever been, they surely wouldn't start it with only five missiles, he said. The truth was that the false alarm was created by an alignment of sunlight on high-altitude clouds above North Dakota. Colonel Stanislav Petrov would die at age 77 in the suburbs of Moscow in 2017. He credited his hesitancy to report the nuclear attack to his civilian background. His colleagues, all professional soldiers with purely military training, would certainly have been more keen to follow instructions and, according to him, would have reported a missile launch if they had been on his shift. By 1983, the Soviet Union possessed 36,000 nuclear warheads. Had Petrov reported the launch as he should have, a full-scale Soviet nuclear counterstrike would have killed around 50% of the US population, more than 100 million people. If the US had then fired its 23,000 nuclear warheads, it would kill a similar portion of the Soviet population. Factoring in the hundreds of millions who would die from climate, agricultural, and energy disruption, an International Research Institute calculated a potential death toll from starvation of around 2 billion. It's incredible that the confidential nature of the Cold War has meant that the lives of these bona fide heroes were only truly honored after their deaths. Each prevented a devastating nuclear exchange. Both were criticized for their actions at the time, Arkhipov for allowing B-59 to surface off the coast of Cuba, and Petrov who was intensely questioned after the event and never rewarded for his decision because his superiors were embarrassed by the faults discovered in the missile detection system. Eventually, they got their just dues. In 2014, Petrov was awarded the Dresden Peace Prize from the Association of World Citizens for his work at Serpikov 15. In 2017, 55 years after his courageous decision during the Cuban Missile Crisis, Vasily Arkhipov's daughter, Elena, and his grandson, Sergei, accepted the inaugural Future of Life Award on his behalf, given at a ceremony at the Institute of Engineering and Technology in London. Petrov would live to see a dramatized documentary made about his life released in 2014 starring Kevin Costner. It was aptly titled The Man Who Saved the World. Petrov maintained that he didn't deserve the spotlight. During an interview for the film, he mentioned that it could have been anyone in his place. I was just in the right place at the right time, he humbly said. Vasily Arkhipov and Stanislav Petrov, we tip our hats to you. What war hero stories would you like us to talk about next? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from Military Experts.